A starship stranded decades away from home. A motley crew of enemies forced to work together, with some spy shenanigans thrown in to make things even spicier. The removal of anything remotely resembling a support network, meaning they'll need to survive by their own wits and whatever they find along the way, a bit like Space MacGyver, but with somewhat looser rules on not killing people. The premise of Star Trek Voyager is a promising one, giving us a whole new area of unexplored space to find interesting things and probably blow them up a bit while we claim moral superiority. It's the Starfleet way. It's also a perfect setup for seeing how long-term isolation can affect a ship and its crew. The basic logistical challenges alone mean we'll have to adapt to survive. After all, we only have a limited number of irreplaceable supplies, so we'll need to mend and make do, right? And so we run into our first problem. The reality of the show never really delivered on one of the core implications of their situation that things would need to change. There are some minor nods to it, occasional mentions of trades for spare parts, for example, but those jury-rigged systems are never really seen. How many times did an engineer remove a panel in the show to reveal the internal workings weren't Starfleet? I can't think of a single one. There are good reasons for that, of course. Making a set isn't cheap, so saying we need to throw perfectly good bits of it out every few weeks and replace it with something else is a hard sell. Anything adapted from alien tech means a new physical item to create, something that needs to be stored and catalogued, with notes for the writers and prop departments so it'll be consistent in future episodes. That's why they were still using bioneural gel packs after seven years, despite us being told they're irreplaceable and having them get destroyed by explosions or viruses or Neelix's cheese. That's why they were still using Federation fireworks after seven years, despite us being told they're irreplaceable and Janeway throwing them around like they're given away for free every time we fill up the petrol tank. And that's also why Voyager herself rarely changed, and never for more than a couple of episodes, despite hull breaches and rushed repairs and talk of alien tech. The switch to CGI from physical models may have made things cheaper, but cheap is a relative term in Hollywood. So we had plenty of mentions of things having been improved, upgraded, retrofitted, and cobbled together from whatever we just nicked, but they're all under the bonnet and never to be seen or heard about again. Those are all good reasons from a production standpoint, but from the perspective of the viewer at home, they serve to entirely undermine the idea that this journey was one of hardship and deprivation. There was no visual distinction between Voyager and any other Starfleet ship operating in Federation space. The difficulties and shortages upon which the premise hinged never came to pass. For all intents and purposes, Voyager was basically on a long cruise. We saw the solution to that problem in the show itself. Season 4's Year of Hell two-parter explored exactly how persistent change would have played out, just at high speed. Voyager takes damage which remains throughout the story. Characters are genuinely affected by events rather than simply reacting to them. Things change and are all the more engrossing because of it. That story played out over a whole season was an idea embraced by the writers and would have given us precisely the sort of consequences that Voyager lacked throughout the majority of its run. As Brian Fuller, a regular writer for Voyager, tells it, the idea of a long burn story was pissed on by Rick Berman, much to the frustration of those involved. To be fair, there are some valid reasons for that decision, not least of which the perceived underperformance of Deep Space Nine, which had used a serialised approach. That being said, if ever a premise would have benefited from long-running and darker narrative themes, Voyager was it. And it's also worth noting that Deep Space Nine is now considered by many fans to be the pinnacle of Old Trek, precisely because it used that approach. We may not have seen the change we were promised by the concept of the show, but that doesn't mean change was entirely lacking. Voyager herself was a steadfast bastion of permanence, but it would be unfair to say the same is true of some of her crew. In fact, the growth of many of those characters was both surprising and pleasing in equal measure. A cynical man like myself might even go so far as to suggest the writers who wanted continuity but weren't allowed to put it in stories found a loophole by using the characters instead. <laughs> 
Tom Paris starts out as a cocky bellend, using bravado and nonchalance to cover his own insecurities, and over the course of the series deals with some of those problems, not always healthily or successfully, and matures into something more. Neelix joins us as a possessive and toxic asshole, but we learn those behaviours stem from the loss of his entire family and the constant fear of losing people again. It's likely also why he's always so overbearingly chipper, partly in attempt to convince himself that he's fine, partly to ensure that nobody ever has a reason to leave him. Over time, he becomes both accepted and accepting, managing to overcome the protective cynicism he was forced to adopt to survive. The Doctor's progression from piece of equipment to member of the crew was probably the longest burn of the show, and a constant thread of continuity as a result. Come to think of it, that might also be part of why he's regularly a fan favourite, too. A similar exploration of growth was found in Seven of Nine, which is all the more impressive when you consider it's no secret that Jerry Ryan was brought on largely to be put in tight clothes and ogled. That writers were able to do so much more than that with the character, and Ryan herself was able to deliver it despite some pretty questionable wardrobe choices, is to their credit. It's not all rosy, though. For every example of a crew member providing more than expected, there were some confusing absences. Seven years. Seven years. Not a single backstory episode. That's just not right. In fact, the lead character is the one whose past is least explored. Who the bloody hell thought giving Janeway nothing was a good idea? Okay, we get a bit in the pilot about a guy and a dog, and a bit in another episode a few seasons later taking them away, but that's it. No exploration of the events that defined her, no glimpse into her formative years. Even Kim got regular mentions of his family and a time-fuckery episode about his life back on Earth. Speaking of which... A rookie so green that his combat should have training wheels. He started out as the baby of the crew, and somehow managed to stay that way, even after we gained five actual fucking children. The character of Harry Kim is arguably Voyager's biggest failure, and a great example of how an actor's talent can be entirely neutered by being given nothing to work with. Future Janeway deleting the timeline where he actually got promoted is the perfect summary for how he was treated throughout. Harry Kim is the crew member that never was. People say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I'd argue it's paved with not doing your bloody homework. Wanting to provide representation is a good thing. Wanting to make sure that representation is accurate is a good thing. Not making sure the expert you employed was actually Native American pisses all over the last two sentences. Jackie Marks was a fraudulent shitbag who claimed Native American heritage he didn't have and made a fuckload of money from it. He was brought on as Voyager's consultant for aspects of Chicote's character, despite his fraud having been credibly exposed a decade prior. I suspect the resulting realisation that he was full of shit and just sprinkled stereotypes over the character was a significant contributor to Chicote being regularly ignored by the scripts. As the name that gets second billing on the title sequence, that's a terrible situation to be in for all concerned. Threatening situations aren't very threatening without a threat. In Star Trek, that usually means a big bad that we fight regularly. For the original series, it was Klingons. For the next generation, it was the Borg. For Deep Space Nine, it was the Dominion. For Enterprise, it was... I don't know, apathy and boredom? And here's where Voyager again stumbles a bit. The original idea for a constant big bad is the Kazon, and they could generously be described as a bit shite. It's difficult to strike fear into the heart of your enemy when you look like somebody's glued pine cones to your head. The Kazon never managed to feel unique or deserving of their place at the head of the table. It would be a whole season before they even started down the road to something interesting with their backstory of freeing themselves from oppression, and for most people, it was already too late by then. Bringing in the Borg later on was supposed to reignite that feeling of constant threat. It worked for TNG after all, a breakout enemy popular enough to be featured in two separate season cliffhangers. And therein lies the problem. We already knew them. Their story was half told by the time they came to Voyager, and constant retreading of it only served to water down their reported omnipotence. <laughs> 
Couple that with the need to make a single science vessel be capable of defeating or eluding them every time, and the whole thing served to rob them of any real menace by the time future Janeway finally stopped toying with them and pulled the trigger. Rather than giving Voyager an antagonist, their inclusion instead ultimately served to declaw a galactic threat. What's more frustrating is that they had the perfect nemesis right from season one, Seska, the Cardigan spy, was a charismatic, devious, ruthless asshole, and utterly delightful as a result. Having somebody who's resourceful and relentless be a recurring nemesis, somebody trained to succeed no matter the cost, is far more entertaining than knock-off Klingons or hand-me-down cyborgs, whilst also giving the writers a perfect excuse to have her allied with whatever group of assholes are in this week's episode. There's a reason why the Master has been the constant antagonist in Doctor Who. That reason is their versatility. They can pop up anywhere, in any plot, with any ally, and fuck shit up. Seska could have provided that same role in Voyager, a perfect counterpoint to the morality and integrity of Janeway, on the weeks when she's not doing a genocide anyway. Slightly playing up the connection between Chakotay and Janeway would also have given Seska a reason to pursue them due to her jealousy, whilst also providing Chakotay with more to do in general, a problem that plagued the character throughout. Well, we're in a series overview video, so I suppose we should do a top five list, if only to give you all something to fight about in the comments. Meld we got our first proper chance to see Tim Russ drop the stoicism, and had a delightful performance from Brad Dourif as everybody's favourite murder bastard, Lon Suda. It's also notable for showing the Vulcan need for answers to be as much a potential weakness as it is a strength. Course Oblivion You'd be forgiven for reading such an uninspired name and assuming this one was equally bland. What we actually got was probably the darkest story from Voyage's entire run, Taking the overall feel of the show in a completely different direction was a brave choice, even before you consider an ending that takes such tragedy and reduces it to a footnote in a log. Tuvix. Any story that still has people debating a quarter of a century later clearly did something right. While the idea that only the Doctor objected never really sat right with me, the moral dilemma posed in the episode is enough to make it a classic. She totally did a murder, though. Distant Origin. A change of focus to something entirely different, a long string of continuity knots from multiple seasons, political intrigue, and no happy ever after. Distant Origin features many of the things I wanted from the show as a whole. Blink of an Eye. Another episode that breaks from the standard Trek mould. Voyager's part in this story is second to the investment we have in seeing how this civilization progresses in real time. Well-placed recurring elements do a good job of tying together segments that could have proven jarring if handled differently. Honourable mentions go to Death Wish for handling difficult subject matter well, something repeated throughout the show's run. Jatrell for giving us angry Neelix and his background. Twisted for showing us that our regularly unbeatable crew can be humbled. Counterpoint and its excellent psychological interplay, as well as the toll such things take on Janeway. Living witness for some genuinely surprising reveals. Repentance, largely for the excellent performances on show. We can't have a list of the good stuff without mentioning the stinkers, though, so here we go. The 37s. A laughable premise of aliens travelling halfway across the galaxy to gather slave labour from a backwards planet is the flimsy excuse for sticking Amelia Earhart in an episode. That the story starts out by finding a pickup truck covered in horse shit is perhaps a subtle attempt at foreshadowing. Nemesis The mostly predictable twist is only the second worst offender for this one, the primary problem being a constant barrage of butchered dialogue. Even if that made sense with universal translators, which it doesn't, that still doesn't stop it from getting in the way of what little story there is. And that po-faced final line can go do one as well. The Fight. A perfect example of how a great concept doesn't mean a great story. Having the narrative jumbled and chaotic in an attempt to emulate the situation Chakotay's trying to deal with is an interesting idea, but it also renders the story largely nonsensical as a result. Barge of the Dead. 
The clumsy dialogue towards the end as Balana rails against expectations, paired with the story essentially undermining its own premise, makes this entirely skippable. None of the personal issues she deals with are new to us, and her mum saying the whole thing might just be bollocks anyway means it's just wasting your time. 11.59. What if Star Trek was a daytime made-for-TV film? The answer to a question nobody asked is 11.59. That this masquerades as a background episode for Janeway while being nothing of the sort only adds insult to injury. Dishonourable mentions go to Fairhaven and Spirit Folk for their terrible portrayal of the Irish, a Star Trek tradition. Projections for a pretty predictable series of twists that outstate their welcome. The disease for pissing away one of the rare chances that Kim gets to star and having some of the most wooden acting in the entire show's run. I imagine many of you watching are surprised to not see Threshold in the bottom five list. For me, that one's a bit more complicated, so we're going to deal with it separately. Abandon the shit story. Abandon the bollocks science. Abandon the lizard kids, just like the crew did. Threshold was the first real chance we got to make Paris relatable, the first time where he showed us just how badly his father had fucked him up by placing the weight of expectation on him. He was taught from a young age that he was expected to not only excel, but that he was destined for great things. So when the chance to be the pilot for a completely new and entirely untested method of propulsion came along, he seized it as a way of fulfilling this expectation. We know how the story ends. It goes to shit, he turns into a lizard guy, and he kidnaps Janeway to go off and make reptile babies. Ignore all of that wank, though. It's some of the worst writing of the show, and the reason why people, quite understandably, cite Threshold as a proper stinker. But imagine what we could have had from this. Imagine a Paris who completes this flight. For whatever tech reasons, it can't be used to get them back home, but he breaks Warp 10 and will be famous as the pioneer pilot who did so. And then, nothing changes for him. Instead of this experience being the life-altering event it had been built up as, he's forced to face the truth that no single incident will fix the insecurities and flaws instilled in him by bad Admiral Paris. He struggles to cope with who he is, but now without the hope that everything will suddenly fall into place if only he could achieve the greatness his father wanted. Watching him fall apart and be helped back together again by those around him, coming to terms with his childhood and accepting that he wasn't at fault, could have made him the greatest character of the entire show. Instead, he shagged the captain, laughed it off, then spent much of the season having a subplot about falling apart, only for it to be revealed as a ploy so he could be Space James Bond. Of all the episodes, of all the plot threads, that one has stuck with me the most. Paris goes on to deal with some of his baggage and to become more than the dick he started as, but it was here that the character could have best shown who he truly is, and why. When we compare that potential to the bad science and latex puppets that we actually got, it's easily the biggest single miss for me. It's worth mentioning that everything I've said so far should be taken with a pinch of salt. It's easy to point and pick holes from the comfort of your sofa, making wide-ranging proclamations about what would have been definitively better. We get to do this free from consideration of the constraints placed by executives, or even what would have worked based on how television was broadcast at the time. It's easy to forget just how much has changed during the intervening years, with things like video on demand meaning that serialised stories are now far more viable than they were when a single missed live episode could mean that people stopped tuning in. Our perfect vision of Voyager might well have been axed after two seasons due to poor viewing figures. And what we got clearly wasn't a failure either, as you don't get renewed if you're shit. Not unless you're Earth Final Conflict, anyway. It's fair to say the momentum built up by prior Trek shows helped, but Voyager still managed to get the same number of seasons as they did, so it must have been doing something right. Those who view it as a flawed gem, myself included, need to reconcile that opinion against prevailing trends of the time. Voyager was created just before the cusp of TV shows all taking the route of larger story arcs, and that fact will inevitably make people wonder what we could have ended up with if it had been commissioned after success stories like the Battlestar Galactica reboot. 
For many, it'll always be the show that fell short of greatness, but if you're willing to put that preconception to one side and judge it for what it is instead of what it could have been, there's much to like. If you've enjoyed this brief glance at an old TV show, we're going to be doing more of it with Deep Space Nine soon. Such ponderings are made possible by the generous nature of those souls whose names are currently scrolling ever upwards on their journey to the Celestial Temple. You can join them over on patreon.com slash ussspedant to kick a quid my way if you're so inclined, and perhaps receive the blessings of the prophets in return. Blessings of the prophets are not guaranteed. Ascension to the Celestial Temple may require access to a wormhole. The USS Pedant accepts no responsibility for injury or death caused by Parathes. Thank you.